Okay, let's have a look in the index. Okay, G, G, G. Hmm. Everybody knows that The Amazing Spider-Man was Spider-Man's first ongoing comic book series. But what was his second? That's right, Marvel Team-Up. If I was to ask you what his third ongoing comic book series was, what would you say? If you said Peter Parker the Spectacular Spider-Man, you were wrong. Spider-Man proved massively popular from his very first appearance in Amazing Fantasy issue 15 in the summer of 1962. Before long, issue one of The Amazing Spider-Man was launched, and its enthusiastic reception meant it quickly changed from a bi-monthly to monthly release schedule. Nine years later, in 1972, Marvel Team-Up was launched, a title that would pair Spidey up with a different hero or team of heroes every issue. Issue 18 of that series tried something a little bit different, as another very popular character, the Human Torch, took over the lead. In 1974, Marvel tried something new. It started to release giant size editions of some of its titles. These weren't giant size in terms of the size of the pages, but more in terms of the number of pages. And each issue proudly displayed a banner proclaiming 68 big pages. Those 68 pages were usually made up of a longer than usual original story, the kind of length you'd normally find in an annual, and some reprint material. The first title to get this treatment was Marvel's first family, The Fantastic Four, cover dated May of 1974, although that first issue was called Giant Size Superstars. It was only from issue two onwards that it fully adopted the moniker Giant Size Fantastic Four. The following month saw a one-off in the form of Giant Size Superheroes, not Superstars this time, and that starred Spider-Man, Morbius and the Man-Wolf. The Avengers, Defenders and Conan the Barbarian would all follow suit, along with a fully-fledged Spider-Man title. The reprint material in this issue comes from Strange Tales Annual No. 2, but as you can see, the main story stars Spider-Man along with the Prince of Darkness himself, Dracula. Nothing says the 70s more than Dracula, except perhaps Kung Fu and Karate. My eldest brother liked Marvel, but he was also heavily into martial arts and I cannot overstate my disappointment at seeing him come home with a bundle of comics only to discover that they all revolved around Marvel's stable of Kung Fu characters. I don't like Kung Fu. As for Dracula, well, the 70s were a decade in which horror-related characters were very popular in comics. Since the Comics Code Authority was founded in 1954, any association with horror was explicitly banned from a comic that bore the CCA logo. Adherence to the code was not mandatory, but retailers and advertisers shied away from any comic that did not feature the CCA stamp on its cover. As such, the big publishers adhered to it strictly. The code specifically prohibited the word horror from being used in any comic book title. Similarly, any scenes dealing with or associated with the walking dead, vampires, ghouls or werewolves were banned. But in 1971, the code was relaxed. Zombies were still not allowed, but the likes of werewolves and vampires were now permitted, due to what was seen as their literary history. Thus, the 70s saw publishers make up for lost time. Within a year of the relaxation, Marvel launched what would be their two most successful horror-themed titles, Tomb of Dracula and Werewolf by Night, both of whom would get the giant-sized treatment. This comic came out during the period when comics would have slug lines at the bottom of the page advertising other titles out that month. In this issue alone, seven of them are advertising horror-themed comic books. Of course, this comic also came out at a time when Spider-Man already had two other ongoing series. Marvel weren't quite confident that there was enough appetite for the character to sustain three titles. <laughs> I know, right? So every month that Giant Size came out, Marvel Team-Up didn't feature Spider-Man. Instead, it starred that chap from issue 18, The Human Torch. Enough chit-chat. I'm sure that you are as intrigued as I am to see how two characters from two different genres meet. This story starts in a very down-to-earth way, with Spider-Man dealing with a burglary at a jewellery store. Now, we never get to see the burglar, and neither does Spidey, because he seems to be constantly shrouded in shadow, 
even though he isn't actually in the shadows. Not only that, but the burglar gets away. That's it. Spider-Man doesn't stop him and he won't stop him. But he does leave behind a clue as Spider-Man slips on a patch of ice and he comments on the fact that you don't get ice in 60 degree weather. But this whole episode where he deals with a character that he doesn't even get to, to catch or know the identity of is there for a reason. Because it's a bit of a, a handoff to another comic. More of which in a moment. Spidey leaves the site of the burglary and goes to see his Aunt May. And oh God, she's ill again. And Peter engages in this, I, I suppose it's um, affectionate teasing, but the things he comes out with, like Mrs. Watson tells me you've been out playing pro football again behind my back. Pro football. I'd love her to turn around and say, Peter, don't patronize me. I'm an old woman. Even if I was an old woman, I wouldn't be playing pro football. But no, she seems to enjoy it for some reason. Now, yes, she's ill, but this time she seems to be more ill than usual. Um, and Peter reacts to that emotionally. Forget that. Look at those hands. You want to know how to draw hands? Look at that. Fantastic. It's a masterclass in one little picture. Peter thinks that the doctor is holding out on him, so he speaks to him privately, away from the ears of Aunt May and uh, Anna Watson. And the doctor explains that Aunt May actually has um, a particularly virulent uh, strain of flu that's currently sweeping across the nation. There is only one known vaccine, and that is currently being brought into the country by the person who's, who discovered it, which is AJ Maxfield. Now, AJ Maxfield, unfortunately, is afraid of flying. So instead, the vaccine is being brought across with its discoverer by boat. By the time the boat arrives in the United States, it's going to be too late and Aunt May would have died. Of course, Peter isn't going to stand for this. So he says he's the man that can do something about it. Now, if you didn't know we were in the 70s already, you soon would just due to this very next page. Because for a start, we've got Johnny Storm wearing the red and yellow outfit that he wore briefly uh, in the mid 70s. That always looks to me like there's been some kind of printing error. And the other thing is that he, Johnny Storm, mentions the Spider-Mobile. Why is Spider-Man there anyway? Well, two reasons. The big reason is he needs transportation and fast because he's got to get out to that ship and get that vaccine. Johnny uh, helps him out in this regard and he points him in the direction uh, of a super fast craft that Reed Richards has just finished uh, building. Now, how would Spider-Man know how to fly that? Not a problem, because the torch explains that he has preset the automatic pilot to take Spidey to the boat with the doctor and the vaccine. And once he's there, he just presses the red button on the console and that'll bring him right back uh, to FF headquarters. It's as simple as that. Oh yeah, the other reason that Spidey's there, he tips off Johnny Storm about the burglar that was shrouded in shadow earlier on in the comic. And so Johnny says, okay, I'll go and check it out. And he does, because at the bottom of the page, we see one of those little slug lines that advertise other comics. And it says, fire versus gold. I think it's supposed to say cold. The Human Torch versus Iceman in Marvel Team Up. So that whole little scene at the beginning of this comic was just a setup for Marvel Team Up issue 23. That was the first one to star the Human Torch instead of Spider-Man because Spidey was in this comic. Before you know it, Spider-Man has found the liner that is carrying the Doctor and the vaccine. I didn't say it was a cruise ship. Oh yeah, the Doctor travels in style. Uh, he lands on it and changes into his civilian clothing so he can mix with people and track down AJ Maxfield. He isn't the only extra person to arrive that night because we see a bat lands on the deck. And as it does, it changes into the form of the Prince of Darkness himself, Count Dracula. And why is he there? Well, he's there searching, you can guess, can't you, for AJ Maxfield. And that's because he says that the vaccine that Maxfield has developed could one day interfere with his well-laid plans. Plans that he doesn't share with us. At that moment, he bumps into one of the other passengers. It's Peter. Oh, a bit of a teaser for what's to come. Believe it or not, they aren't the only people on this boat searching for AJ Maxfield because the mob are there as well and they are disguised as a marching band. And they're looking for AJ Maxfield because uh, their boss uh, has been banned from the United States. 
So he wants to get the vaccine for Maxfield so he can then trade it uh, for a pardon and be allowed back into the United States. Dracula, meanwhile, has found his first possible victim on board. It's a woman who's dressed as a Valkyrie. Did I mention that there's a fancy dress party on board? He's about to attack the woman when her partner is there. And he says, hey buddy, that's a great uh, a vampire outfit you're wearing. Let me take a picture with my snazzy new Polaroid camera. As he says, these days, the cameras almost take the pictures themselves. Yes siree, 1970s, the peak of camera technology. Peak of technology or not, the couple quickly discover uh, that the guy they took a picture of doesn't show up in the photograph. And then they turn around to discover that he himself uh, has vanished from where they were. Where is he? Well, he stumbled across a couple of the mobsters. They don't appreciate the tone he uses with them, and they try to attack him, try to shoot him with a machine gun, no less. But of course, it doesn't get them anywhere. Instead, he hypnotizes them and gets them to walk off of the side of the ship to fall into the water below. Soon, the Count finds a second victim. And as he bites her, she screams, and Peter hears that scream, so runs to see if he can help. When he arrives, all that he finds is the body of the unconscious woman and a bat that flutters off into the night. He takes her to the captain to get help, and the captain puts a call out uh, for the ship's doctor to help out. And who arrives? None other than Dr. Maxfield. Whilst the doctor's there, the mob also burst in, wanting to kidnap him. The female, dressed as the Valkyrie, hits one of them over the head with her shield. They then knock her out, and the mob with the doctor uh, run off leaving just the Valkyrie, the captain, and, well, it should be Peter Parker, but the captain has turned round to discover that Peter Parker has vanished. A quick costume change, and Spidey is on the trail of the mobsters. And it doesn't take him long to find them. And then it's non-stop action, as he outmanoeuvres and outfights all of the mob members. He is cracking wires during the fight, and one of the mob members comes out with a, a pop culture uh, reference that hasn't aged at all well, as he threatens that he's gonna waste Dr. Kildare. Ask your parents. This really is a fun sequence of Spidey goofing around as well as beating up the bad guys. Eventually, he defeats them all, but Dr. Uh, Maxfield has run off in a panic. So Spidey now has to try to find him again. Dr. Maxfield, meanwhile, has run straight into uh, a room where there's a party going on, and one of the guests, one of the people there, is Dracula. Not only that, but the mob boss is also there. He then pretends to be ill to get the doctor away from everybody else so the doctor can take him to his cabin. And whilst they're walking along the upper decks, they're being followed from a distance by the Count. Soon, the Count catches up with them. The mob boss gets at his flick knife and tries to stab Dracula. But of course, it has no effect. Instead, Dracula uh, hypnotizes him so he stands dead still, and then Dracula makes his first proper victim on the boat of the mob boss. Now that must have taken a little while, but nonetheless, the doctor was waiting patiently for his turn to be terrorized by the Count. And Dracula picks him up and just throws him overboard. And that's it. With his mission accomplished, he changes back into a bat and flies off into the night sky. Little does he realize that as uh, Maxfield is on his way down, hurtling towards the sea, he strikes Spider-Man, who is climbing up the side of the boat at the same time. So Spidey saves Maxfield. They then stumble across the very last mobster who Spidey takes care of, before Maxfield then drops the biggest bombshell of all, as he says, I'm not AJ Maxfield. Then another voice says, of course, how could he be AJ Maxfield when I am? And they all turn round to see it's the woman in the Valkyrie outfit. Who would have thought a woman, a doctor? Well, that really showed up our prejudices, didn't it? Although not really, because on page 19, she completely ignored the captain when he said, Doctor, Dr. Maxfield, thank you for answering my call. And it was the man that was with her that actually did reply and say, we came as quickly as we could, Captain. Even Peter says, Maxfield, him. So you forgive us for thinking that the guy that actually responds to the name Dr. Maxfield is Dr. Maxfield. And then a couple of pages later, 
when she was attacking the mobster with her shield, she even says, Take your hands off him, you filthy ruffian. Don't you dare handle a man of medicine that way. Yeah, that's right, man of medicine, because the guy is the ship's doctor. Who would have thought there'd be two doctors standing side by side in the doorway when the captain looked up and said, Dr. Maxfield? And what about Dracula? Now I guess he's going to discover that his plans have been scuppered uh, and he's going to return for a big showdown um, fight with... Hmm. No, that's it. That is the end of the story. There's one more mention of Dracula and it just says that he uh, goes to sleep oblivious to the fact that his plans have been thwarted. But that's it. There is not going to be a big confrontation between him and Spidey. There's no team up. I mean, there couldn't be really because Dracula is clearly a bad guy. In fact, the only time they met in this whole story was when they bumped into each other on the ship's deck. And even then they, they didn't know who each other was. So that's that. It was always going to be difficult anyway to have Spider-Man and Dracula in the same story because they do inhabit, or at least in this period of time, they inhabited different kind of corners of the Marvel Universe. Dracula was a more horror-oriented, um, adult-themed uh, part of, of Marvel, whereas Spider-Man, of course, was a cornerstone of the crime-fighting, uh, costumed mystery men part of, of Marvel. So it's always going to be difficult. And I guess this is the only way they could do it. And they kind of, they do allude to that in the editorial in the same comic. But it does make me think, really, why bother? Issue two. Uh, issue three gives us another odd pairing. This time Spidey's co-star is Doc Savage, an adventurer hero with heightened abilities who some consider to be the original superhero. He first appeared in 1933 in the appropriately titled Doc Savage magazine. This was a full five years before the Man of Steel made his appearance. These stories were presented in prose form and were later republished in true novel format. In 1940, he made his first comic book appearance, courtesy of Street and Smith Comics, a subsidiary of the publishers of his magazine. Marvel acquired the rights to the character in the 70s and gave him his own short-lived series in 1972, along with another equally short-lived black and white series under their Curtis magazine's imprint in 1975 the same year that they gave him a, you guessed it, giant size edition. Since then, the likes of DC and Dynamite Entertainment have produced new Doc Savage material. Doc Savage, the man of bronze from the 1930s and our own friendly neighborhood Spider-Man from the 1970s. How are they going to bridge that gap? We begin with Spidey breaking up a raid on the Guggenheim Museum by gang. And one of the gang members says he's an expert in Kung Fu. Wait, what are you doing? The next review. Of what? Show me. We're not doing issue two. It's too Kung Fu-y. But... No, issue three, please. Okay. All I would say is it's a decent enough issue uh, in which Spider-Man teams up with Shang-Chi after initially fighting due to a misunderstanding. It came out at the time when Shang-Chi's father was none other than Fu Manchu. And his portrayal is a bit problematical these days. Okay, well, move on, please. We don't need to see any more of your racist Kung Fu comic. Okay, okay. Well, this issue begins with a lovely uh, roofscape scene. And while Spidey's sitting up there on the roof, he spots a light twinkling in the distance. And then he realizes it's Morse code and he decodes it. And it's a message for him asking for his help. How very convenient. He swings over to the source of the light, which is coming from uh, the demolition site of some old building. Although this is nighttime, so there isn't actually anybody working there. And when he arrives there, he's greeted by a karate chop to the neck. Strangely, the person who attacked him is the same person that sent the Morse code message. And her name is Decina. And he knows this because uh, it's said that Decina needed his help in that message. She speaks some strange uh, unknown language. And he says, look, I don't know why you hit me, but I'm willing to listen to your reasons, if you can speak English. And she doesn't. However, she does say that her transubstantiator does. Translator, surely. 
that self-same translator performs other tricks and she now uses it to open a window onto the past as she points to um, a cornerstone of the building that's got the year 1934 inscribed in it. And suddenly the window on the past opens up and she and Spider-Man see Doc Savage and his acquaintances. It is 1934 and Doc Savage and company are at the exact same spot that Spider-Man and Athena are at uh, in the future or the present day or the past now really. Anyway, in the 1970s. They're watching the mayor of New York give a speech at the dedication of the self-same building that's now being demolished. And whilst they're there, they see a shady character in the crowd who pulls out a gun and is going to assassinate the mayor of New York. That is, until Doc Savage flies in. And yes, you do see right, the colour process uh, on these couple of pages is awful just for Doc Savage. So the assassination attempt is foiled and we see that Doc has a much better relationship with the NYPD than Spider-Man does because he uh, and his little gang are actually breaking the speed limit. But still the police say, ah, oh, it's okay, it's Doc Savage. He's one of the good guys. They return to their uh, base of operations. Now the reason they were at that site was because they'd been sent a message saying their help was needed. And the message was written on paper that Doc himself describes as not of this world. And he also thinks that the reason they were called uh, to attend there wasn't uh, to foil the assassination attempt. He thinks there's something else, something else going on, something else that requires their attention. Spider and Decina are still watching this. And as they do so, suddenly there's a big ground tremor. Masonry begins to fall and is going to hit Decina. So Spidey swings across uh, and saves her, although she has fainted. At that point, some massive, is it a phantom, is it real creature emerges from the shadows. Laying Decina to one side, Spidey then attempts to take on this big creature with limited success. It's only when he realizes that there's some kind of electrical field involved uh, in the uh, existence of this creature and he sees uh, an electrical jackhammer uh, nearby. Americans call them jackhammers, we Brits would call it a pneumatic drill, but they're not normally electronic. Nonetheless, uh, this one is, and he uses that, he throws it at this creature, and that kind of causes a short circuit, and the creature disappears. Decina regains consciousness, thanks Spider-Man for his help, but he says, look lady, you've got some explaining to do. What is going on, and how does what's happening today tie in with what happened 40 years ago? So she says, okay, I'll tell you everything. And she explains she was there 40 years ago. In 1934, we see that Doc Savage and his friends have returned to the construction site at night to investigate further. He sees the light, the same light that Spidey saw earlier. The light, as before, heralds the approach of Decina. She explains that it was her that sent that message on the Not of This World paper, and she needs his help. So he says, enough banter, explain what's going on. She explains that she's from a, a world which exists parallel to our own dimension. Whereas your world, our world, exists in space and endures in time, her world exists in time and endures in space. She does then go on to say, I see your companions still do not understand. Well, count me in love. She then explains that on that world of hers, uh, she was a scientist conducting experiments. And one day um, her assistant in the lab tripped and fell uh, into their prototype space time device. The fall into that machine was fatal. But before he dies, he says, the device, it projects our electrical aura, transforms it, transmits it. In the name of mercy, Decina, stop the transmission. She is unable to, and he dies. But she then uses the transubstantiator, which helps her travel between dimensions, so maybe the name for it is right after all. And it can also track down that aura that he spoke about. So she then sets out to try to find him. Now, in the accident, not only did it transform his aura into this transmissible energy, but it drove him mad, drove him evil, in fact. And she now needs uh, Doc Savage's help uh, to stop him. 
At that point, right on cue, Taros appears, speaking the same language that Decina does, but without the transubstantiator, people can't understand what it is he's trying to say. Doc and his whole gang try to subdue him. At one point, they manage to throw ropes around him to temporarily keep him under control, but not for long. Doc tries to keep him busy, uh, whilst another couple of members of his team go back to their HQ to get some equipment that will hopefully help uh, put a stop to him for good. Whilst he's fighting uh, Taros, at one point Taros shouts out Decina's name, but that is the only word that Doc and his friends can make out. Soon enough, his team get a device uh, to Doc. Now they're working on the basis of this creature being electrical in nature. So they think that if they can dampen the electrical flow, then they should be able to contain it. And so they've sent this device uh, to Doc that looks a lot like a fire extinguisher, and he uses that to dampen down the creature's electrical flow and contain him in a foundation stone for the building. Now that the building is being demolished, Decina fears that Taros will be released again. Decina tells Spidey that he has to make sure that Taros is finished for good. She says he has no other choice. But Spidey has a hunch. He thinks that although he couldn't understand the words uh, of the creature, he did recognise a tone of anguish in it. So working on that hunch, he picks up the jackhammer from earlier on and he uses it specifically to break the foundation stone. And that does free up Taros. The newly freed Taros challenges Decina in their own language. And in reply, she says, and if I did trick you, Taros, you deserved it, you traitor. We don't get any more of an explanation of their history than that, but then we never did have an explanation as to why she karate chopped Spider-Man when he first arrived uh, at the demolition site. Taros then disappears and he seems quite happy and Spidey says, can't believe it, he thanked me. Decina turns to Spidey and says, I don't believe it. How could you see through my lies? But Doc Savage, that wonderful man, couldn't. Spidey says he always suspected her, probably didn't help that she karate chopped him. But also he and Doc are from different eras with different attitudes towards women. In Doc's day, women were supposed to be demure little things. But nowadays, <laughs> I hear what you're saying, Spidey. I hear what you're saying. She then says, you gotta help me because she begins to vanish because Taros is somehow pulling her back uh, into their own dimension. And he says, no, you've made your bed, you lie in it. She vanishes and then Spidey swings off with the eyes of the past looking on approvingly. So it's another odd tale where the two main characters don't actually properly meet. This time, they don't even bump into each other whilst strolling about uh, on the ship's deck. Doc doesn't even know that Spider-Man does or will ever exist. And Spider-Man, yes, he saw Doc through that window in the past, but again, he couldn't communicate with him and will never meet him. Very odd that two out of the first three issues in this series have been like that. Issue four saw a more traditional form of team up as they paired up Spider-Man with the Punisher before issue five saw, I know, I'm joking, I'm joking. I bet you all wet your pants when you saw Frank Castle's ugly mug on that cover. By now, the writer for the series had changed. Len Wein was the writer for issues one and two, but from the Doc Savage story onwards, it was Jerry Conway who had taken over the reins. Ross Andrew was the artist for all five issues. Jerry Conway has a distinguished career in comics, and especially with Spider-Man. He wrote a number of issues of Marvel Team Up, wrote nearly 40 issues of The Spectacular Spider-Man, almost as many issues of Web of Spider-Man, and spent three years writing The Amazing Spider-Man, a period which saw the death of Gwen Stacy, the apparent death of the original Green Goblin, the original Clone Saga, and the introduction of The Punisher. That introduction had only come the year before this issue, so this is one of his very earliest appearances. The good news is, both main characters in this comic most definitely do meet. Although at times I do wonder if it was actually originally written as a Spider-Man story. You'll see why in a sec. We begin with a rather sinister scenario, whereby we've got three people uh, wearing um, ski masks, balaclavas, whatever you call them, uh, strangely with built-in bobble hats, and they clearly have broken into someone's home 
and have kidnapped a woman from her home. Um, we assume she was in bed because she's wearing a negligee, but they are in the process of bundling her out of the home. Her screams draw the attention of our friendly neighborhood, Spider-Man. And this is the bit that makes me think that maybe this wasn't originally a Spider-Man story, even though it's written by Jerry Conway, the, the regular writer for this title at this point. And Jerry Conway knows Spider-Man, but this isn't Spider-Man in terms of characterization. There's a whole page where he fights the three would-be kidnappers and he says nothing. He's completely silent. There's no banter, no wisecracking. Um, they're, they're saying things to him, but they're getting nothing back. It reminds me a lot of when Craven the Hunter uh, was masquerading as Spider-Man during Craven's last hunt. The next page just reinforces my doubts even more because it turns out there's actually a fourth person in the gang that was trying to kidnap that woman. And he was sneaking up on Spidey, but then he's taken out, shot, assassinated, shot in the middle of the forehead by someone across the street who we can't see, but obviously no prizes for guessing who it was. And Spidey just says, wow, so there were four of these clowns. Looks like I've got myself a guardian angel. Spidey isn't okay with people getting shot in the head. He's now dead. He's had his brains blown out. And Spidey's kind of, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder who did that. Odd. It just, it just isn't Spidey. The emergency services soon arrive to take care of the would-be kidnapped victim, which of course is Spidey's cue to leave the scene. The Punisher is also leaving the scene. We see him in his van driving away and explaining that he was there um, due to a tip-off. No more details other than that at the moment. He's currently based uh, in an abandoned power station, uh, which he's quite happy with because he says it's so secure. Then he gets out the van, opens up the back doors, and who's there? It's Spidey. I guess he did know it was the Punisher after all. Explanation time. The Punisher was there that night following up a lead about some toxic gas. Spidey thinks that it's uh, an official government army weapon, but the Punisher says no, it's not. It's a commercial product available to whoever can meet the price. Entirely illegal. The would-be kidnap victim was just the latest in a whole string of kidnappings where people are being taken from their homes and flown to an unknown South American country where they can experiment on them with that gas to make sure it is as deadly as possible. And all these kidnapped victims um, are being killed by the gas, and then some. Spidey flips out a bit at seeing these images because he sees that there are women and children involved. And he also has a go at Punisher because he says the Punisher would have allowed that woman to have been kidnapped tonight so that he could then follow them to find out where the kidnapped victims were being taken to. Punisher deals with this by shooting Spidey with a tranquilizer dart. Then he comes to later and we are told that he has now come round to understanding why Punisher is doing what he's doing and he's agreed to help him. The first part of this operation is to attack uh, the offices of Deterrence Research Corporation, the organization behind the experimental gas and the kidnappings. And they are led by a man called Moses Magnum. Well, he doesn't sound like a criminal mastermind at all. The first step, of course, is for the Punisher to launch himself through a window. Although for once, he actually explains why he did it. He says, I came through the glass doors hard. That's a good way to catch the enemy off guard. I thought it was just because it looked cool. Whilst the Punisher is busy murdering people on the lower floors, Spider-Man has entered the building higher up. And he seems quite happy with all the murder that's going on below him. After taking out a number of guards, Spidey smashes his way into the office. That was a door. It was a glass door. He could have just opened it. Moses Magnum doesn't appreciate the intrusion and he tells his guards, kill him. We are then treated to seeing both the Punisher and Spider-Man deal with different uh, numbers of guards in their two different locations. The Punisher does okay, but Spidey is overwhelmed. And we see Moses Magnum uh, instruct his guards, no, don't kill him. After all, I have a feeling he'll be more useful alive. Well, hold on a moment, mate. Two pages ago, you said kill him. Kill him, don't kill him, make your mind up. At that point, the power is cut to the whole building because that's what the Punisher was doing uh, in the basement. But it's too late. Spider-Man has been taken away uh, by Moses Magnum's men. Punisher seems to think it's all going to plan, though. Next thing we see, Spidey is being thrown out of one of those incredible vehicles owned by Moses Magnum and is being thrown into the camp 
where all the other kidnap victims are in this unnamed South American country. Even the kidnap victims don't know where they are, although one of them does say to Spidey that Pa figures we're in the jungle somewhere. What gave it away? Before long, Moses and his guards catch up with Spidey and Moses whips off his mask to reveal, oh, is it Peter? Once Moses and his guards have finished having fun with uh, Spidey, they leave him be. And then left uh, in private, we see that it actually is Peter, but he just had some um, mouldings uh, that he had in his mouth to change the shape of his face. And although he doesn't say it, we assume um, coloured contact lenses because he doesn't have blue eyes. Now, at this point, all of the kidnapped victims are being held in what well, is very much like a prisoner of war camp, that kind of setup. And underneath the floorboards of the hut in which Spidey and some of the kidnapped victims are being held is the Punisher. And he's there because they sewed a tracking device into Spidey's costume, so he was able to follow him. Now it's time to put an end to the camp. Cue action as Spidey and the Punisher team up uh, to defeat all of the guards. They're both wearing gas masks because, well, look. Spidey catches up with Moses Magnum and it turns out that he is a lot stronger than your ordinary guy. Apparently, a lot of people uh, didn't like Ross Andrews' art when he was working on The Amazing Spider-Man uh, and presumably this title. I do. I don't have any issues with it at all. I think it's good. And look at that. That's a brilliant a bit of physicality in that picture where we can see Spidey really being pushed out of shape. Moses picks up a large canister of the deadly gas to use as a weapon, but as he's standing there holding it above his head, the Punisher comes in with gun in hand. Spidey says, hold on Punisher, don't shoot because that canister is full of the deadly gas. But the Punisher does shoot, he shoots the canister. Spidey leaps forward, pushing Punisher out of the room and slamming the door behind him and seals it, saying quite glibly, phew, I wouldn't want to be Magnum now. I'll say, because Magnum, like his namesake, is melting. And all Spidey seems to do is gloat. He does say to Punisher afterwards, didn't you hear me warn you that the canister was full of the deadly gas? And the Punisher just smiles and Spidey thinks, do you know what? I don't want an answer. I'm not happy with that. Spidey wasn't just gloating, he sealed in Moses Magnum. He could have saved him. He could have got him with a web line and pulled him out. It's odd, Jerry Conway didn't seem to work out how to reconcile the Punisher's methods with Spider-Man's morals and ethos, so he just didn't bother. Nonetheless, it was an enjoyable issue, don't get me wrong. And it was nice seeing Spidey somewhere other than New York. Seeing him in the jungles of South America made for a nice change. We travel from the jungles of South America to the swamps of Florida for our last adventure in the series as Spidey teams up with Man-Thing, another very 70s character. Who came first, Man-Thing or Swamp-Thing? Well, strictly speaking, it was Man-Thing, making his debut in issue one of Savage Tales, cover dated May of 1971. But Swamp-Thing came out so soon after two months in fact, in issue 92 of House of Secrets, that you'd be hard pressed to claim that he was a rip-off of Man-Thing. As incredible a coincidence as it seems, it must have been that the creators, Roy Thomas and Stan Lee for Man-Thing, and Giant Size Spider-Man's very own Len Wein for Swamp Thing, came up with the ideas for their characters independently of each other. Man-Thing progressed from his one-off appearance in Savage Tales to a regular spot in Journey Into Fear, before then headlining his own series in 1974. Spidey is sick of New York and feels like he needs a holiday. He sees on a TV set a news report about the man thing down in Florida and he thinks if he can get Jonah Jameson to agree to send him on assignment to try to track down this man thing he can have himself a nice little break. Incredibly Jameson agrees to it but even more incredibly we have in this issue a rare thing for this or any team-up comic. Proper characterization. And in this case, it's Mary Jane, because we see her talking to Peter on the phone. And this is possibly during MJ's best period, really, where she's still pretending to the world at large that she's always uh, out having fun and always uh, looking for a good time. Whereas we know that there's more to her, there's more depth to her. 
And we see this perfectly here, where she's on the phone talking to Peter, initially excited because she thinks she's going to meet up with him, then disappointed when clearly she isn't because Peter's going to go to Florida. And then we can see how disappointed she is. But when she turns around to face um, Anna Watson, then she's beaming and the usual, oh yeah, everything's fine. There's never a problem with me. Speaking of problems, Peter calls Doc Connors, who lives down in Florida. And he says, I'm going to be down your way. Maybe we can catch up and you can help me try and track down this man thing. To which Doc Connors, because the two of them are good friends, says, yeah, sure, absolutely. But then we see, just after that, Doc knocks off a test tube full of a formula which is very similar to the one that changed him into the lizard. Similar? Well, unfortunately, it has the exact same effect. And before you know it, the lizard lives again. Doc Connor's wife is there, but she is soon thrown aside by the lizard because he needs to get out of the house and back into the swamp because for some reason that he isn't quite uh, sure of, he has to find the man thing. Before he leaves New York, Peter stops off at Betty Brandt's apartment, but he's not there to see Betty. Now we've already had a bit of characterization in this comic, which is a rare thing. This is gonna blow your socks off because he isn't there to see Betty Brandt, he's there to see Gwen Stacy. Now they don't know it, and the readers at this point in time didn't know it yet, but we have the benefit of hindsight. And this isn't the real Gwen Stacy, this is Gwen's clone, because this takes part during the original the original, original clone saga. Peter is mainly there to apologize for how he behaved um, when she first reappeared after her apparent death. But she generally is just confused and doesn't know what's going on because the last two years of her life just seem to have vanished. And there's some real great work from Ross Andrew here. Equally great, but in a very different way, is the next full page splash as we head back down to Florida. We are observing the man thing, and the man thing is observing Edmund. Now Edmund has gone down to the Florida Everglades to end it all. His life has become a mess, he's bankrupt, so he's decided enough's enough, he's going to end his life, and he's gonna do so in Florida. He's lost in his thoughts contemplating this, but then he's snapped out of them as he realizes the man thing is right behind him. And he thinks the man thing is gonna attack him, but it doesn't. In fact, it attacks a crocodile that was about to attack Edmund. Well, Edmund says it's a crocodile, so I guess he really is a bit of a loser. Otherwise, he'd know that you don't get crocodiles in the Florida Everglades. They're alligators. Whatever it is, the man thing defeats it and then just shambles away. Edmund is amazed and he thinks, actually, he can make a fortune from this creature. Maybe his luck has finally turned around. Spidey is now in Florida. He's spoken to Mrs. Connors so he knows what's happened uh, to the doctor. And he's out in the Everglades trying to track him down. Luckily, or rather unluckily, he finds him. Rather, the lizard finds him. Needless to say, they fight, during which time the lizard seems to have the upper hand. That is, until Mrs. Connors joins in and she turns a high-powered garden hose onto the lizard. And the lizard says, do you suppose that stream of water can harm me? That's what I was thinking. It doesn't harm him, but it does provide enough of a distraction to give Spidey the time to come up with a new offensive. He bites his tail, and that does harm him. It also gives Spidey the opportunity to use his webbing to string the lizard up by his limbs between two trees. Elsewhere in the swamp, Edmund is still following the man thing. We learn that Edmund's plan involves getting the man thing back to so-called civilization. He doesn't tell us any more than that, but I guess, what, is he gonna make his fortune from um, exhibiting the man thing, perhaps? I guess so. He also sees that various of the uh, swamp creatures are following the man thing, including another crocodile. Maybe they escaped from a zoo or something. These creatures aren't actually following the man thing, it's just that they all, including Man-Thing, are heading in the same direction because they are responding to a summons from the lizard. The lizard, by the way, is on fine, insulting form in this comic. A few pages back, he referred to Spider-Man as a plump primate, and now he calls him a pulp-skinned simpleton. Something else I've noticed about the way the lizard speaks in this comic 
is that he doesn't hiss whenever he says the letter S, which is good, because I don't know about you, but whenever I've read that in other issues that feature the lizard, I've just kind of ignored it. It takes too long to hiss every time you speak with the letter S. With Man-Thing and the other creatures there, the tide of battle turns in the favour of the lizard. Man-Thing, under the lizard's influence, attacks Spider-Man, whilst the other swamp creatures work to free the lizard. Suddenly, Edmund stumbles across this scene of chaos, and Mrs. Connors begs him to help. He says, what can I do? I'm just a chemist. And she says, chemist, come this way. At that point, the lizard becomes free, but also the man thing turns on the lizard. Why? Spidey thinks he understands. He thinks the man thing reacts to emotions, providing a feedback to the strongest emotion around. The lizard's rage must have overloaded the monster's emotional circuits. So now he's fighting back. If you say so. Elsewhere, Edmund is trying to work on that antidote. But because of his recent emotional crisis, he's lacking confidence. He just doesn't think he can do it. He doesn't think it's worth even trying. Mrs. Connors points out that the antidote originally was uh, put together, was formulated by Spider-Man. And Edmund says, well, if Spider-Man can do it, so can I. It's a bit arrogant. Nonetheless, he does succeed in putting the antidote together, but things quickly take a downward turn. Because as Edmund runs out to get the antidote to Spider-Man, he trips over one of the snakes, one of the many snakes and lizards that are attacking Spider-Man, and he drops the antidote. But all is not lost, because whilst it's mid-air, Spidey catches it with a web line and throws it in the direction of the lizard, and it smashes on his skin, covering him in the antidote. Again, the lizard's plans have been foiled as he slowly resumes his human form. And he says, not when I'd almost won. This time, the world could have been mine. With the man thing in my control, I could have, I could have. What? Tell us, what was your plan? How would you take over the world thanks to man thing? We will never know. Doc Connors is now back in full control and he's reunited with his wife. Spider-Man swings off, Man-Thing shambles off into the swamp, and Edmund leaves the scene with a newfound belief in himself. That's nice. And that was the last proper issue of Giant Size Spider-Man. There was an issue six, but that consisted solely of a reprint of Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number Four. Where the other five issues are concerned, I have to be honest. I struggled with the Dracula and Doc Savage stories, especially the Doc Savage one, where it just felt like I'd been tricked into reading a comic I wasn't interested in. The other three issues were decent enough team-ups, and the Man-Thing issue was particularly enjoyable. For some reason, Man-Thing team-ups always are. Why is this series so often overlooked? I think there were a couple of elements working against it. Firstly, it's short shelf life. Only lasting six issues, and each of those being published three months apart, meant that it wasn't often seen amongst the other regular comic books. If you weren't reading comics for the 15 months of its publication, then that's it. You probably wouldn't even know that it existed. Compare that with the 10 years or more that the likes of Marvel Team Up uh, and Web of Spider-Man were published, then it's no surprise that this slipped under so many people's radar. Secondly, when they weren't reprinting material, the giant sized comics of any of these titles rarely, if ever, tied in to their character's continuity. That means they weren't part of any classic storylines, and nor did they really add any depth to their character's world. If you ask most comic book fans to name a giant sized title, they will probably say either giant sized X Men, because it actually is a significant issue, or giant sized Man Thing, because it's funny. For just a couple of years in the mid 70s, Marvel released almost 70 giant-sized titles for both their best-known and not quite so well-known characters. But by 1976, it was all over. Even their most successful character, Spider-Man, was unable to keep his giant-sized title going. But don't feel too sorry for him. Less than a year after the cancellation of giant-sized Spider-Man, a new Spider-Man title was launched. Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man. That would run for over 250 issues and would quite rightly be considered one of the classic Spider-Man series. <laughs>